Stewart's Heir of Slytherin, which is uh, chapter 17. <clears throat> Hearing Ron go down um, into that chamber to with with uh, Gilderoy Lockhart because he says he can do all this stuff. Lockhart uses the Obliviate um, spell, but he has Ron's wand. Okay, Backfires, wipes his own memories away, uh, creates a um, cave-in of the cave with Ron and Lockhart on one side, Harry on the other side. So Harry has to go off to try to find Ginny. That's where he pick up with the heir of Slytherin. He sees Ginny on page 307, runs to her, and he hears a little voice say, or a soft voice, say, she won't wake. Harry turns, and he sees a tall, black-haired boy leaning against the nearest pillar, watching. Tom? Tom Riddle? Because he's seen him in the book. He knows what he looks like in the diary. Knows what he looks like. What do you mean she won't wait? She's not, no, she's still alive, just. Are you a ghost? A memory preserved in a diary for 50 years. We're going to find out much later on how he's preserved in the diary. Which it's not dealt with at all in this book. So Harry, you, you've got to help me, Tom. And Tom's like, mm, you're not quite understanding what's going on here, Harry. And Harry looks up and he notices Tom has his wand. Harry says, thanks, reaches out for it, but Tom doesn't give it to him. If the basilisk comes, it won't come until it's called, says Riddle. What do you mean? I, I, look, can you give me my wand? I might, you won't be needing it. What is, Harry's not very quick, right, on the uptake. I mean, he's can, being pretty clueless here. We're in the Chamber of Secrets. I mean, we can talk later. We'll talk now. Okay. And Tom kind of pretends to do a Ginny voice. Bottom of 309. Oh, it's very boring. No one's ever even stood me like you, Tom. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. He goes on. And he relates how he got Jenny to do things for him. He talks about the memory that he showed Harry. And said, you know, it wasn't that difficult to get Armando Dippet to believe that Hagrid opened the Chamber of Secrets before. Given what Hagrid is, though he doesn't tell Harry what Hagrid is. And then Harry says, um, only, or he says, Tom Riddle says, only the Transfiguration teacher, Dumbledore, seemed to think Hagrid was innocent. Harry, I'll bet Dumbledore saw right through you. Well, he certainly kept an annoyingly close watch. Okay. They keep talking and Tom Riddle says, page 313, how is it that you, a skinny boy with no extraordinary magical talent, managed to defeat the greatest wizard of all time? How did you escape with nothing but a scar? Take them off or leave. Just take them off or leave. Okay. How is it that you, a skinny boy with no extraordinary magical talent, managed to defeat the greatest wizard of all time? How did you escape with just a scar while well, Lord Voldemort's powers were destroyed? Harry, what do you care? Voldemort was after your time. And Tom Riddle shows him how he's not. He pulls out Harry's wand and waves it in the air, and Harry sees the words, Tom Marvolo Riddle. He waves the wand, and the letters reshape. And Voldemort says, when I had become the greatest sorcerer in the world, Harry, you're not. 
Now what? Not the greatest sorcerer in the world. Sorry to disappoint you at all that. I mean, very British kind of language. But the greatest wizard in the world is Albus Dumbledore. And everybody knows that. What's Harry doing? Why does he say that? Does he know what kind of situation he's in? This is, you know, possibly a death situation? Really? I think he does. So why is he doing it? He's pissing him off. Intentionally. Dumbledore saw through you when you were at school, and he still frightens you now, wherever you're hiding these days. Dumbledore's been driven out of this castle by the mere memory of me. Really? Is that why Dumbledore is gone? Why did Malfoy get the Board of Governors to temporarily remove Dumbledore? Because the Chamber of Secrets has been opened and, you know, they just can't have that happen anymore and it's got to be stopped. It has nothing to do with Voldemort or Tom Riddle. Harry, he's not as gone as you might think. What does that mean? Is, is Dumbledore somehow mystically around? Has he, you know, sent a ghost or... Riddle opens his mouth and Harry suddenly hears music. And there is Fox. And Fox comes to Harry. And Tom Riddle says, that's a phoenix. Fox? says Harry, and that, as he sees that Fox has dropped something, that's the old school sorting hat. And then he laughs. He goes, really? That's it? That's the protection Dumbledore sends you? The old school hat? Who did the hat belong to? Godric Gryffindor. So when we're told in the first sorting hat song, that the hat is old and patched. It's a thousand years old. Okay? This is what Dumbledore sends his defender, a songbird and an old hat. Do you feel brave, Harry Potter? Do you feel safe? And I always imagine, if I were filming it, he'd be going, ooh, you feel safe now? Harry doesn't answer because he doesn't know what to say. So how did you survive? Tell me. Longer you talk, longer you stay alive. So Harry says, no one knows why you lost your powers. I don't know myself, but I know why you couldn't kill me. My mother died to save me. My common muggle-born mother. She stopped you killing me, and I've seen the real you. I saw you last year. What did he see? A face stuck on the back of another guy's head. So your mother died to save you. Yes, that's a powerful counter charm. I can see now. There is nothing special about you. Okay, if the 16-year-old Tom Riddle can understand that that would be a powerful counter charm, then why wouldn't the fully grown, what did I say, Voldemort's now 68, 67? So when he attempted to kill Harry, he would have been 56, something like that. Then why didn't the 56-year-old Voldemort know when Lily Evans or Lily Potter does this over her baby that she dies to protect him, that that's not going to be a powerful counter charm? So there's nothing special about you at all. I mean, I wonder, you know. Even you must have seen the similarities. We're both half-bloods, orphans raised by muggles. What does Tom Riddle mean by half blood? Half blood, half pure blood. Yes. Is Harry half muggle? No. Yes. Were either of his parents muggles? Oh. No. Lily was a witch. James was a wizard. Lily was born to muggle borns. So what does he mean by half blood? He doesn't mean literal. What he means is anybody with even a ounce of muggle DNA. 
any with even an ounce of muggle-bornness to them. Okay. Probably the only two parcel mouths to come to Hogwarts since the great Slytherin himself. We even look a little bit alike, he says. So he says, now I'm going to teach you a little lesson. And he speaks to the giant snake statue, basilisk statue, and out of it comes a basilisk. Okay. And Slytherin tells the basilisk to kill Harry. Harry runs. <laughs> you know, he's just trying to stay away from the... And Fox goes after it. Okay. Fox blinds it. And Harry sits there, help me, help me, help me, someone, anyone. And the snake's, snake whips the sorting hat into Harry's face. And he puts the hat on and he thinks, help me, help me, please help me. Why does he put the hat on? Because the sorting hat spoke to him before. And he's thinking, maybe. But instead, the hat squeezes itself. And a gleaming silver sword had appeared inside the hat, its handle glittering with rubies the size of eggs. If it's got a handle glittering with rubies the size of eggs, that would be a very uncomfortable handle to hold, if you think how big the size of an egg is. Okay. But anyways, here he's got the sword, and he kills the basilisk. But the basilisk bites him. What are we told? The basilisk poison is fatal. Or we were told that earlier. And here he just kind of slides down along the wall as the poison starts to course through his body. And he praises Fox. And Riddle comes over to him and says, You're dead, Harry Potter. Even Dumbledore's bird knows it. Look, he's crying. And Fox is crying on Harry's wound. And Harry thinks, uh, he blinks. Fox's head slid in and out of focus. I'm going to sit here and watch you die, Harry Potter. Take your time. I'm in no hurry. Harry felt drowsy. And we hear Riddle. So ends the famous Harry Potter, alone in the Chamber of Secrets. And Harry thinks to himself, well, this is dying. It's not so bad. Okay. What did Dumbledore tell him at the end of the first year? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Here, Harry thinks he's dying, but it's not so bad. And he realizes, wait a second, I'm not dying. Everything's coming back into focus. And he remembers healing properties. Okay. Here he grabs the basilisk fang and stabs the book. He doesn't know why, he just does it. He seizes the basilisk fang, plunges it straight into the heart of the book, and then there's a scream. And ink starts to flow out of the book. And as the ink starts to flow out of the book, Ginny starts to revive. Okay. So he takes Ginny, he gets back to Ron, and they go with Fox's aid. They fly back up out of the chamber with Fox carrying Harry, Ron, Ginny, and Lockhart. Remember, Phoenixes can carry very heavy loads. They make their way to the staff room, and Mrs. Weasley asks, how? And Mrs. McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, yes, I think we'd all like to know that. And Harry tells them not quite all of the story. Page 328. McGonagall mentions all the school rules he's broken. Dumbledore shows up and says, what I'd like to know is how Lord Voldemort managed to enchant Ginny. What? Mr. Weasley asks. Dumbledore. Uh, Harry says, page 329. It was this diary, said Harry. Riddle wrote it when he was 16. 
Dumbledore takes the diary from Harry and examines it. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Very few people know that Lord Voldemort was once called Tom Riddle. I taught him myself 50 years ago at Hogwarts. Disappeared after leaving the school. Blah, 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 blah. But what's our Ginny got to do? And Ginny talks about writing in the diary all year long. So, Dumbledore has Miss, um, has McGonagall take Ginny up to the hospital wing. No punishment, etc. And or has Ginny go up there, has McGonagall order a big feast, and leaves Dumbledore and Harry alone. Okay? Why? Because Harry needs to be debriefed. As I said, begins with the first novel and goes all the way through the fifth novel. Harry has a debriefing at the end of each book. Lockhart's still there. Harry mentions, you know, what happened to Lockhart. So uh, Lockhart goes out, and Dumbledore tells Harry on page 332, first of all, Harry, I want to thank you. You must have shown me real loyalty in the chamber. Nothing but that could have called Fox to Well, what did Dumbledore say just before he left Hagrid's hut? You will find that I will only truly have left Hogwarts when there is no one here who serves me or believes in me. Okay. And so you met Tom Riddle. Harry, Riddle said I like him. Strange likenesses. And what do you think, Harry? I don't think I'm like him. I mean, I'm in Gryffindor. Notice, without even thinking, Harry says that. Why? It's very similar to when Frodo says, Gollum, a hobbit, couldn't be. Can't stand the thought of the possibility. Okay? Well, I'm a Gryffindor. And then he pauses. He says, you know, the Sorting Hat wanted to put me in Slytherin. I'd have done well in Slytherin. Everyone thought I was Slytherin's heir for a while because I can speak parcel tongue. You can speak parcel tongue, Harry, because Lord Voldemort who is the last remaining ancestor of Al Salazar Slytherin, can speak parcel tongue. Unless I'm much mistaken, this is pretty important. Unless I'm much mistaken, he transferred some of his powers to you the night he gave you that scar. Okay? Listen to Dumbledore's language and listen to Harry's interpretation of it. Unless I'm much mistaken, he transferred some of his own powers to you the night he gave you that scar. Voldemort put a bit of himself into me? Right. Transferring some of your powers and putting some of yourself into somebody, it's a little different. But Dumbledore doesn't correct him. He says, seems so. So I should be in Slytherin. Why does Harry think he should be in Slytherin? Goes back to what Hagrid says about the Malfoys in Flourishing Blocks. Bad blood. Yep. Bad blood. Right to the core, Arthur. So I should be in Slytherin. The Sorting Hat could see Slytherin's power in me, and it put you in Gryffindor. Why, Harry? You happen to have many qualities Salazar Slytherin prized in his handpicked students. Parcel tongue resourcefulness, determination, disregard for rules. If the sorting hat placed you in Gryffindor, you know why that was. Think. Harry, because I asked not to go in Slytherin. Exactly. Which makes you very different from Tom Riddle. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are. Far more than ours. Abilities. Show me an example of that from the first book. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are. Notice, what does show mean? If someone tells you, show me, what does that mean? You gotta do it, yes. Yeah, reveal it. Make it clear. 
Okay? Towards the end of the first book, someone shows okay, what he truly is and why he belongs in Gryffindor. It's Neville when he tries to stop Harry, Ron, and Hermione. He stands up to his friends for what he thinks is right. Does he have the ability to stand up to them? No, obviously not. All right? It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. If you want proof that you belong in Gryffindor, I suggest you look more closely at this. And he hands the blood-stained silver sword to Harry. Harry turns it over, looking at the rubies, and then he sees a name engraved just below the hilt. Godric Gryffindor. Dumbledore. Only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat. Okay. They just sit there, kind of look at each other. He says, now you need food and sleep. Meanwhile, I've got a right to ask a man. Because Hagrid's still in prison. And I need a new dark arts teacher. And Malfoy shows up. Lucius Malfoy. And cowering behind his legs, heavily wrapped in bandages, is Dobby. Why is Dobby all wrapped up in bandages? Malfoy beat him or has Dobby had to punish himself? Okay. Malfoy wants to know why Dumbledore's back. So you've come back. The governor suspended you. Dumbledore. Well, you see, Lucius, the other 11 governors contacted me today. It was something like being caught in a hailstorm of vows, you know. They said they thought I was best man for the job. And they told me strange tales. Some of them seem to think you'd curse their family if you, they didn't agree to suspend me. Malfoy went even paler than usual, but his eyes were still slits of fury. Why slits? Like a snake shows, you know, who he's a follower of. So have you stopped the attacks? Have you caught the culprit? We have. Well, who is it? Same person as last time, Lucius. But this time Lord Voldemort was acting through somebody else by means of this diary. He holds up the book, and Dobby is making gestures behind Malfoy's back. So Dumbledore is standing there holding up the book, and Dobby's there sitting there going, his book. Okay. And Dumbledore says, good plan, but if Harry here and his friend Ron hadn't discovered this book, Jenny Weasley might have gotten all the blame. And imagine what might have happened then. Wow. The Weasleys, notice, one of our most prominent pure blood families. Okay. Really? Where else in the novels are the Weasleys called prominent? Well... When we get to book four and we have the Quidditch World Cup, they sit up in the box seats next to the Minister for Magic, or just beneath them, actually. So Malfoy says, very fortunate. And Harry suddenly understands what Dobby's trying to get him to see. Okay. And Harry asks, don't you want to know how Ginny got hold of the book, Mr. Malfoy? How should I know? Because you gave it to her. And Harry remembers Flourish and Blots. In flourishing blots, you picked up her old transfiguration book and slipped the diary inside it, didn't you? <coughs> Notice he doesn't say no. He says, prove it. Oh, no one will be able to do that, says Dumbledore. Okay. Malfoy turns around and says, we're going, Dobby. And Malfoy kicks Dobby through the door. 
Harry asks Dumbledore for the book back. He says yes. Pulls the shoe off, pulls the sock off. Okay. And what does he do? He stuffs the diary into the sock. So he takes the book and, you know, does this to it. Stuffs it in the sock. And hands it back to Malfoy. He says, Mr. Malfoy, I've got something for you. He forces the sock into his hand. Okay? With the book. What the? He rips the sock off the diary. Why? Why doesn't he just throw the whole thing away? Okay? It's his book. What else is it? He knew it belonged to Voldemort. Does he know yet? Yes, he does know that Riddle's memories have been wiped from it. Right. Did he know? Ah, I can't ask that question. So he throws the sock aside and he looks at the ruined book. You'll meet the same sticky head as your parents one of these days, Potter. They were meddlesome fools. Come, Dobby. Master has given a sock. Master gave it to Dobby. What? What did you say? Got the sock. Master threw it. Dobby caught it. Dobby, Dobby's free. You've lost me, my servant boy. Shall not I, Mary Potter? Loud bang. Malfoy goes crashing down the stairs. Okay. If you've seen the film, they do it differently. In the film, Harry puts the sock in the book and throws thrusts the book into Malfoy's hand, okay? Which, if you think about it, is quite a bit different. Because in the book, he has to take the sock and discard the sock. In the film, he could just do this. Letting the sock fall from the book is not discarding clothing. But having to take the sock and throw it is, okay? So, um, they get, Harry gets ready to go off to the train and Hermione says, your aunt and uncle will be so proud of you, won't they? When they hear what you did this year, Harry, proud, really? After I could have died all those times? No, they'll be furious. Which leads us to the next book. Right? It's summer again. And Harry gets a letter this year. Only this time he's allowed to get letters. He also gets phone calls. Right? <clears throat> Aunt Marge is coming. Aunt Marge is Vernon's sister. Um, here gets the letter from school, which has the permission slip to go to Hogsmeade. And here he realizes he has to get Uncle Vernon to sign it. But there's only one way to get him to sign it. Harry has to do whatever Uncle Vernon wants. Notice when Harry makes this agreement with Uncle Vernon, he's kind of like Frodo when it comes to the school of negotiations. He doesn't know how to. What he agrees to is, I'll be good when Aunt Marge is here, and as an effect of that, you'll sign my form. What he should say is, you sign my form now, or I won't be. I'll let him know what I really am. I mean, who's got the upper hand in this? I mean, really thinking about it. Harry's got the upper hand. He's got the position of strength. But he wants that Hogsmeade vacation so badly. He bargains it away, essentially. Okay? So Aunt Marge's big mistake. Skipping the first chapter. We hear about Sirius Black who has escaped. We learn from the news. 
And Uncle Vernon says, page 17, no need to tell us he's no good, staring over the top of his newspaper. Look at the state of him, the filthy layabout. Look at his hair. I can tell he's no good just by a photograph. Okay? And then also by the news. So we find out Aunt Marge is coming. And we see the little negotiation, pages 18 and 19. Actually, it's on um, 21. We hear Vernon telling Harry how he's going to behave on page 19. First, you'll keep a civil tone in your head when you're talking to Marge. Harry, I will if she will. Second, says Vernon, as though he didn't hear Harry, is it Marge doesn't know anything about your abnormality. I don't, I don't want any funny stuff. You behave, right? I will if she will. And third, we've told her you attend see Brutus' Secure Center for Incurably Criminal Boys. St. Brutus, brutal. St. Brutus's Secure Center, it's like a prison, for incurably criminal boys, and they let him out? He gets to come home for the summers? Harry, what? Apparently, Aunt Marge has never been there before, or Harry is now old enough to have gone off to the school that he wasn't at before. It's the second. So, Harry goes to Vernon and says, um, I need you to sign this permission form because, you know, it would be awful hard for me to pretend I, I remember. What's that school's name that I go to? And Vernon says, bottom of page 20, you'll get the stuffing knocked out of me if you don't forget, if you don't remember. Harry, knocking the stuffing out of me won't make Aunt Marge forget what I can tell her. But if you sign my permission form, I'll remember where I'm supposed to go to school. And I'll act like a mug, like I'm normal and everything. Okay. And here's where he makes his mistake. Right, says Vernon. I'll monitor your behavior carefully. And if at the end of it you've told the line, kept the story, I'll sign you ready for him. That's where Harry should say, nope, you sign it now. And I promise <laughs> to do the rest. Okay. So Marge shows up. Harry's left to bring in all the luggage. Okay. And she walks right past Harry. Let's see, where do I want to pick up? Page 23. They're having tea. And she looks at Harry for the first time. So, still here, are you? Yes. Won't you say yes in that ungrateful tone? It's damn good of Vernon and Petunia to keep you. Wouldn't have done it myself. You'd have gone straight to an orphanage if you'd been dumped on my doorstop. By the way, it's the third novel that's the first time we've seen, we've seen any swearing. From here on, you start to see more. So that by the time you get to, I can't remember which book it is, five or six, she uses that stupid euphemism, I think, effing, rather than <laughs> that, okay? Or even spelling it out. So Harry was, we're told, bursting to say he'd rather live in an orphanage than with the Dursleys. But he doesn't say anything. He just smiles at her. She thinks he's smirking. I can see you haven't improved since I last saw you. I hope school would knock some manners in you. Where is it you sent him again, Vernon? St. Brutus's. First rate institution for helpless cases. If he's helpless, lock him up. I say, do they use the cane at St. Brutus's boy? Meaning, do they beat you? Harry, uh, oh yeah, all the time. Excellent. Won't have this namby pamby wishy washy nonsense about not hitting people who deserve it. Okay. A lot of people have suggested that Aunt Marge is based on somebody. That she's based on 
Well, Margaret Thatcher, former Prime Minister of United Kingdom, okay? uh, Prime Minister from what, 1979 to 1992, something like that. Okay? One of the longest Prime Ministers in the last 100 years, who was very conservative. Okay? She was kind of regarded as the female Winston Churchill and often represented by a bulldog. Well, Aunt Marge raises bulldogs, okay? And so she asked Harry, have you beaten often? Oh, yeah, says Harry, loads of times. Okay. So a couple days go by, page 25, and Aunt Marge says, this is the uh, third day. You must have blamed yourself for the way the boys turned out, Vernon. If there's something rotten on the inside, there's nothing anyone can do about it. If he's rotten to the core, as Hagrid said, nothing will change that. Harry tries to concentrate on his food. He doesn't, tries not to listen to her. She reaches for her wine. It's one of the basic rules of breeding. You see it all the time with dogs. If there's something wrong with the bitch, there'll be something wrong with the pup. And the wine glass she's holding shatters. Marge, are you all right? Not too hard. You must have squeezed it too hard. Did the same thing at Colonel Fubster's the other day. Because we're led to believe, or we think, that was Harry doing that. Okay. Harry goes against outside, leans up against the wall. It had been a long time since he'd lost control and made something explode. So Harry tells us, he did do that. Even though she thinks she did it because she's done it before. By the way, what does this tell us about Aunt Marge? She's a big girl. She's a strong girl. There's a lot of what's called tensile strength in a glass goblet. Make it, makes it really hard to crush with your bare hand. And that's what she thinks she did. And that's what she did do the other day, okay? Next three days go by, so it's now her last day of being at their house. In fact, it's kind of the farewell dinner, final evening. Harry just has to get it through this night, and he's got his form signed. So they have a fancy dinner, and Uncle Vernon uncorks several bottles of wine. How old's Harry in this book? Thirteen, so Dudley's fourteen. They're probably not drinking any of this wine. If they were in France, I'd entirely believe it. Because French kids start drinking wine 19 years old at the family dinner table. They drink wine, wine like Americans drink water or milk or coke or something. Okay. So you have essentially three adults opening several bottles of wine. How many is several? More than two. Okay. At least three. Like one for each of them? They get all the way through the soup, the salmon. Without a single mention of Harry's faults. Then they have pie. Time for dessert. And now Uncle Vernon brings out a bottle of brandy. So they've had several bottles of wine. And now he's going to bring out brandy. Can I tempt you, Marge? She'd already had quite a lot of wine. Her huge face was very red. In other words, she's drunk. Just a small one, then, she chuckles, okay, and Vernon pours her, you know, a little bit, like a finger, maybe, and she does this, a little bit more than that, you know, keeps tipping the back of the bottle up so that she gets not a finger, but maybe three or four fingers of brandy. That's the ticket. Dudley's eating his fourth slice of pie. 
Mm-hmm. Which, generally speaking, is how much of a pie? Uh, well, well yeah. Pie. yeah. I mean, if you're like me and you have big slices, it's <laughs> half a pie. If you cut up nine to eight, okay. Aunt Petunia sipping coffee, notice how that little finger sticking out, why? What does that show? Class. Class. She has manners. Okay? And all Harry wants to do is go away to his bedroom. He looks at Uncle Vernon, Uncle Vernon says, Nope, you gotta stay here, boy. And Uncle uh, Aunt Marge ah, pats her belly, smacks her lips. Ah, so much for the manners around the table. Okay, puts the empty brandy glass back down. We're not told that she's taken a sip and set it down, and taken a sip and set it down. What has she done? She chugged however much was in there. Yeah, like a shot. But it was more than a shot. Okay. Excellent, North Virginia. And she burped richly and pats her great tweed stomach because she's fat. Pardon me, but I do like to see a healthy sized boy. How healthy sized is Dudley? Probably like these two guests. Okay? I think it's in the next book, he's described as the size of a baby killer whale. I mean, exaggeration, but he's fat. You'll be a proper sized man, Dudders. Yes, a spot more brandy, Vernon. As Vernon pours her more brandy. Now this one here. Harry thinks of the handbook that Hermione sent him for his birthday. This one's got a mean, runty look about him. You get that with dogs. Had Colonel Fubster drown one last year. Ratty little thing it was. Weak. Underbred. Like the sire and the bitch that produced this one were bad. It all comes down to blood. That's our saying the other day. Bad blood will out. Say nothing against your family, Petunia, and she pats Petunia's bony hand. But your sister was a bad egg. They turn up in the best families. Then she ran off with a wastrel, and here's the result. Like, you know, he's a chemistry accident. This potter he never told me what he did. And Uncle Vernon noticed, and Aunt Petunia now look at each other extremely tensely. Why? It's a bit touchy situation. Yeah, pretty touchy topic. What do they know about Harry? He's capable of doing magic. Okay. They also know he gets a little touchy when you talk about his parents. And she's just said that his father was a wastrel. So Vernon, she asked him, what did he do? Oh, he didn't work. Unemployed. As I expected, a no account, good for nothing, lazy scrounger. See, Margaret Thatcher cut the welfare system. She put into play kind of a welfare to work program get people off public assistance and get them working. She also sold off a lot of government property and government stuff, privatized it, okay? I mean, it's a pretty good analogy to say that that Marge is supposed to be Margaret Thatcher. It's supposed to be a caricature of Margaret Thatcher. Harry, he was not. He's shaking all over. Have you ever been that mad before? Or, I mean, you best remove yourself from the situation. Go to bed. Go on, says Vernon. No, Vernon. Her tiny bloodshot eyes fixed on Harry's. Why are her eyes bloodshot? She is wasted. Go on, boy. Go on. Proud of your parents, are you? They go and get themselves killed in a car crash. Drunk, I expect. Here she is talking about drunks. They didn't die in a car crash. They died in a car crash, you nasty little liar. Left you to be a burden on their decent, hardworking parents. And then she starts to blow up. 
Harry runs upstairs, gets his stuff, comes downstairs, points his wand at Vernon, says, I'm going, I've had enough, and leaves. He doesn't know where he's going to, but he just leaves. He goes out, he sees that dog-like shadow, and he trips on the curb and falls like this. Okay, he's right-handed. And his hand goes out into the road and the night bus is there. My students, when I go to uh, London and I teach the Harry Potter course, I'm usually in one of the courses that, um, or I take them on a walking tour the day we get there. We, can, we kind of dump our stuff off at the, at the dorms, and then we, we do <coughs> several walking tours. And I'll take 15, 20 students, and I'll say, okay, when you want to flag a bus, you put your hand out and live. And I'll say, any of you taking Harry Potter, Class, they go, it's like the night. Yeah, it's just like the night bus kind of a thing. Okay. So, Harry gets picked up by the night bus, and he meets Stan and Ern. Okay. And he reads the newspaper about Sirius Black. And what Cornelius Fudge, Fudge says about Black and such. And Harry asks them to take him to Diagon Alley. So I'm going to skip a bunch. He's told them that his name is Neville. He doesn't want them to know who he is. And Harry gets off the night bus just in front of the Leaky Cauldron. And Harry steps down onto the pavement. And we hear page 42. There you are, Harry. What'd you call Neville? Minister? There's Cornelius Fudge. This is Harry Potter. Stan, I knew it. Yes, yes, well, well I'm very glad the night bus picked Harry up. But he and I need to step inside. So Harry goes inside the leaky cauldron with Cornelius Fudge. What does he think is going to happen? Yeah, what happened the previous year? When he did magic, which he didn't do, he got a nasty letter from a father Hopker saying, you know, you violated the restriction for underage wizardry and you did magic in front of muggles. Even though it wasn't him. Okay. So Harry says, um, page 45. When Fudge says, you get to stay here at the Leaky Cauldron for the next two weeks. We've arranged it with your aunt and uncle. You'll stay at Christmas, uh, at Hogwarts over the Christmas holidays and Easter holidays. And Harry says, I always stay, and I never want to go back to Privet Drive. No, you'll, you'll feel differently when the summer comes. You know, I'm sure you're actually very fond of each other. Harry's like, Go away. So he finally asked, page 45, what about my punishment? Punishment? I broke the law. Oh, my dear boy, we're not going to punish you for a little thing like that. Okay? A little thing like that. We don't send people to ask, man, just for blowing up their odds. Book five. What does Fudge want to send Harry to Azkaban for? Saving his own and Dudley's lives. Because he did magic in the presence of a muggle. Okay. Harry, last year I got an official warning just because a house elf smashed a pudding in my uncle's house. Ministry of Magic said I'd be expelled. Circumstances change, Harry. We have to take into account in the present climate. What does fudge sound like? Because it's what he is. A politician. Laws are for little people. <laughs> Those of us in power can do what with the laws? We can tweak them, we can bend them, we can break them. Okay? So, Harry gets two weeks at the Leaky Cauldron. He gets free ice cream from Florian Fortescue. 
He gets his stuff delivered. Right. He gets to wander in and out of Diagon Alley. He gets to look at the new broom, the fire bolt. He gets his new letter saying what kinds of stuff he needs. All right. And da, 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 where am I going to pick up? Page. Pages 55 and following, he runs into Ron and Hermione. Uh, Hermione gets a cat this year. Ron's rat is not doing so well, they so they take him to the rat store. Um, page 61, Harry talks with Ron and the Weasleys, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, Mr. Weasley in particular, about... The search for Sirius Black, and Ron asks, would we get a reward if we caught him? Harry runs into Percy. Again, I'm skipping a bunch. Uh, 64 and 65. Harry overhears a conversation between Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. This is the night before they're to take the cars to King's Cross. And page 65, Harry overhears, makes no sense not to tell him, Mr. Weasley was saying heatedly. Harry's got a right to know. I've tried to tell Fudge, but he insists on treating Harry like a child. He's 13 years old. Arthur, the truth would terrify him. Do you really want to send Harry back to school with that hanging over him? For heaven's sake, he's happy, what? Not knowing. What does she mean? Ignorance is bliss. That's what she means. If he knows, what is it that they're talking about? Yeah, the Ministry of Magic thinks that Sirius Black has escaped Azkaban because he's after Harry. Okay. Arthur, I don't want to make him miserable. I want to put him on his guard. You know what Harry and Ron are like, wandering off by themselves. They've ended up in the Forbidden Forest twice. Did they end up in the Forbidden Forest twice because they wandered off by themselves? No. No. I mean, one time, Harry was taken in by Hagrid. One time, they were led in by Hagrid's advice, follow the spiders, one time they flew into it with the Whomping Willow. The Whomping Willow is just on the edge. Okay? When I think what could have happened to him that night he ran away from home, if the night bus hadn't picked him up. But he's not dead. He's fine. Okay? Harry will be perfectly safe at Hogwarts. We thought Azkaban was perfectly safe. If Black can break out of Azkaban, he can break into Hogwarts. Notice, who's thinking the more logically? Arthur is. Okay. So, Harry goes back to his room thinking, Sirius Black is after me. But he doesn't know why. He doesn't know what relation he has to Sirius Black. The only reason he thinks is because Sirius Black was a supporter of Voldemort. Okay. So we get chapter five, the Dementor. They get on the train, and there's only one cabin car carriage they can get in, and it's the one with a professor. Professor R.J. Lupin, page 74. He's got a ratty pair of wizard's robes, and he's asleep. And he's pretty young. Okay. Hermione reasons, it's got to be defense against the dark arts, because there's only one opening. So they stay in there. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch.
Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle come in, 79 and 80. Uh, and then the train stops, 82, 83. It gets dark. The door suddenly opens. Okay. Neville comes in. On page 83, the door slid open before Lupin could reach it. Standing in the doorway, illuminated by the shivering flames in Lupin's hand, was a cloaked figure that towered to the ceiling. Its face was completely hidden beneath its hood. Harry's eyes darted downward, and what he saw made his stomach contract. There was a hand protruding from the cloak. And the hand was slimy looking and scabbed like something dead that had decayed in water. This creature looks like the ghost of Christmas present in Dickens as a Christmas Carol. It's visible for only a split second. Harry feels an intense cold. Okay. He feels like he's being dragged downward. And he passes out. Lupin, we're told, is able to send this thing away. And he gives Harry chocolate and the others, page 85. Harry asks, what was that thing? A Dementor. One of the Dementors of Azkaban. Now, until you've read this book, you've never heard of one of these. But you probably have heard of those. What's a mentor? Somebody who guides, a teacher, someone who somebody who you look up to, somebody who helps direct you, who helps you kind of you know become everything you can be, kind of a thing. Okay. Why? Because this comes from Latin mens, which means mind. It's someone who's going to help develop your mind. So a de-mentor is someone who's going to undevelop your mind. Someone who's not going to guide you, not going to treat you, not going to train you. Rowling has said the dementors are symbolic of like depression. Because what happens when you come near a Dementor? Lupin's going to spell this out in a later chapter. All hope, all joy, everything positive gets sucked out of you. So then what are you left with? Bad thoughts, bad memories, bad experiences. Okay? Harry asks the others, why? what happened? Well, you kind of went sort of rigid, fell out of your seat, started twitching. And Lupin stepped over, you walked toward the Dementor, pulled out his wand. And he said, none of us is hiding serious black under our clothes. Go. Neville says, it was horrible. But what does Neville do? He leaves the carriage. Page 87. Malfoy shows up. And Malf Malfoy says, You fainted, Potter? Is Longbottom telling the truth? You actually fainted? Why does Neville go out and tell everybody Harry fainted when the Dementor showed up? Because Neville. Keep going. Make who look weak? Is he trying to make Harry look weak? What's maybe the not, flip maybe side of that? Maybe his dementia. How does Neville look if Harry faints, but Neville doesn't? Okay. He's building himself up. Okay. But Malfoy takes it just the opposite way. Ooh, did you faint as well, Weasley? He says to Ron when Ron tells him to beat it. 
Did the scary old Dementor frighten you too easily? Lupin comes back in. Okay. So they get up to the school, and McGonagall tells Madame Pomfrey what happened on the train, because they have to send Harry up to the hospital wing, kind of get him checked out. Okay. And they tell Madame Pomfrey that Lupin gave Harry some chocolate. And Madame Pomfrey says, page 90, did he now? We finally got a defense against the dark arts teacher who knows his remedies. It's not just that. We're finally, third book, going to see a defense against the dark arts teacher who knows what he's doing. Okay. Um, okay, so we have the beginning of the year feast. Dumbledore explains about the Dementors, explains about you're not to go outside you know, the grounds of the castle. You're not to go in any of the secret passageways. They've got every place guarded, etc. And we get talons and tea leaves. Um, and this is our first introduction to Sybil Trelawney, right? who teaches divination two L's <clears throat> so they go up to Trelawney's class she has them looking crystal balls she has them reading tea leaves blah 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 blah, blah. she makes predictions she says somebody's going to die this year all I really want to say about, I think, this chapter of Trelawney is this. There's one person throughout the novels that's a fraud, and that's Sybil Trelawney. That is, when the books were published, you know, a lot of people condemned them for, they thought, leading kids into magic. Kids want to start playing with Ouija boards. They want to start doing black magic. They want to start the whole nine yards. There's only one form of magic used, displayed in the books, that has a bearing to real world magical practices. It's Sybil Trelawney's. It's divination. It's tarot cards. It's tea leaves. It's crystal balls. It's fortune telling, etc. Okay? And that's the one form of magic in the books that Rowling presents how? Complete, yeah, complete BS. Complete nonsense. McGonagall doesn't believe in it. McGonagall says it's nonsense. And even Dumbledore is going to say it this now at the end of this. You know, I think that's the second time Sybil Trelawney has uttered a true prediction out of she's been teaching, we're going to find out, for many years, 12 years, in fact. She started the year Harry was born, okay? And she's been making wild, crazy predictions about deaths of students and other things all throughout. But she said two accurate predictions. One made before Harry was born and another one made at the end of this novel. Okay. Um, so Hermione doesn't like divination. Why? She can't get any books part time. Yeah, exactly. She it's it's not rational. It's not logical. Okay? So they go off to Hagrid's class. Hagrid's new care magical creatures teacher. Where they are introduced. What do we find out about Buckbeak? Buckbeak's a hippogriff. Okay, it's a mixture of a griffin and a horse. A griffin is a lion and an eagle. Okay. And a horse. What characterizes hippogriffs? 
They are proud creatures. So you have to approach them with respect. You go up to them, you bow to them, and only if they bow back can you go closer. Okay? So we see Harry. Harry goes up, he bows to it. Buckbeak bows back. Harry gets on Buckbeak, flies all over the place. What does Malfoy do? Calls it a great brute. Doesn't bow properly, and Buckbeak bites him. Okay. The result of that is Malfoy's father tries to get Buckbeak executed. Okay. Let's see. Um, Harry, Ron, Hermione go down to Hagrid's hut that evening. This is at the very end of chapter six. Because they're trying to cheer him up. Page 121. And Ron says, don't worry, Hagrid, we'll back you up. Hermione takes Hagrid's drink away from him. I think you've had enough to drink. Okay. Hagrid goes and sticks his head in the barrel, and he comes back in, and he suddenly realizes, you guys aren't supposed to be out of the castle. Okay. We get chapter 7, Boggart in the wardrobe. Malfoy still pretend to be gravely wounded. Okay. Harry has potions. Snape's mean as ever. Uh, Hermione's seemingly taking more courses than is humanly possible. Let's see here. They get to defense against the dark arts. And Lupin leads them into the staff room, page 132, and says there's a boggart in there. Okay. He asks Snape to leave. He says there's a boggart in there. Okay. And he says, page 133, boggarts like dark enclosed spaces. Wardrobes, the gap beneath beds, cupboards under sinks, etc., etc. And so he asks, What is a barber? Hermione, it's a shapeshifter. It takes whatever form will frighten you the most. So it's a good job. So, when each of them sees the barber, it'll be the thing they fear the most. So he says, That means we have a huge advantage over it. And they're like, Wait a second, if it's the thing I fear the most, how do I have an advantage? And he asked, do you know what it is, Harry? Here, mm, nope. Uh, because there are so many of us, it won't know what shape it should be? Yes. Okay. So it's always best to have company when you're dealing with a boggart. The boggart will get confused. Okay. So he says, there's a charm that can repel a boggart. The ridiculous charm. So he tells him how to make it. First, he asked Neville, what's the thing that frightens you most in the world? Neville, what was that again? Snape. Okay, everybody laughs. Now, you live with your grandmother? Mm, yes, but I don't want the bogger to turn into her either. Everybody laughs again. No, no, you misunderstand. What kind of clothes does your grandmother wear? A uh, hat, tall one with a stuffed vulture on top, long green dress, sometimes a fox fur scarf. In a handbag, that is a purse, yes. Okay, so can you picture those clothes very clearly? He's like, yes. So when the bogger comes out, Lupin says, it's going to take the form of Professor Snape. And you will raise your wand and cry ridiculous and concentrate hard on your grandmother's clothes. And what should happen is that Professor Snape will be seen wearing your grandmother's clothes. And everybody laughs. Probably not the wisest thing to do to make a colleague appear, you know, this way. Boggart comes out. And what do we see? Snape with the clothes. Okay. Harry's thinking, what am I going to see? Voldemort? <laughs> a Dementor? 
Jerome's turn. Okay. Take its legs off. What's so scary about a big, huge, giant spider if it doesn't have any legs? So Lupin says, everyone ready? That is, have you all got, you know what your worst fear is. What are you going to do to diffuse that fear? Harry's still thinking, uh, what do I do with Voldemort? What do I do with a Dementor? So Neville does his. Parvati goes next. There's a mummy. She does ridiculous. And the mummy starts to unbandage at its feet, and so it falls. Seamus Finnegan comes up. Instead of the mummy, there's a banshee. She opens her mouth. There's a horrible screech. Seamus shouts, ridiculous. And instead, the banshee turns into a rat, which chased its tail. Okay? Then it becomes a rattlesnake and all these other things. Ron goes forward. Harry asks Lupin, page 139. He gives all kinds of points for people. And Harry, but I didn't do anything. Because Harry didn't get a chance. Well, you and Hermione answered my questions correctly at the start of class. Really? So that's what houses now get extra points for? For being right about something? All right. So compare that first lesson with Gilderoy Lockhart's. Cool. Okay. Lupin is cool. Hermione says, but I didn't get a lesson either. I didn't get a try at the bogger. Ron, what would it have been for you? A piece of homework that only got nine out of ten? One year, partially relevant. One year when my eldest son was fairly young, I don't know, was nine, ten, something like that. We went trick-or-treating for Halloween, and I made him a sandwich board to wear, you know, over his front and over his back that looked like a giant report card. I mean, this was his, his idea. And it was you know, history, math, science, everything. Everything was F. I mean, just all the way down the line. People loved that card, okay, or that Halloween costume. Next chapter, Fly to the Fat Lady. Okay. They're talking about Quidditch. Oliver's like, this year we're going to win it. We should have won it last year. Should have won it the year before. Um, let's see, where do I want to pick up? Oh. Uh, they go off to Hogsmeade. Halloween morning. I think we're going to finish early today. Let's, um, no, we'll do this part. They go, the others all go off to Hogsmeade. Harry runs up and meets with Lupin. Explains that, you know, he didn't get a go. And Lupin raises the question about Harry's tea leaves. Because Harry saw the grim, which means death is coming. And Lupin tells him, McGonagall told me, you're not worried, are you, Harry? No. And then Lupin says, anything worrying you, Harry? No, well, yes. Why didn't you let me fight the barter? Well, I should have thought that was obvious. Harry's, why? I assume that if the barter faced you, it would assume the shape of Lord Voldemort. He says the name. He doesn't say it would assume the shape of he who must not be named. Lupin had said Voldemort's name. The only person Harry had ever heard say the name aloud. Lupin, clearly I was wrong. But I don't think it would be an idea for Lord Voldemort to materialize in the staff room. Harry, I didn't think of Voldemort. I remember those Dementors. Lupin, wow, I'm impressed. That suggests what you fear most of all is fear. Very wise, Harry. Harry, so you didn't think I could fight the market. And there's a knock on the door, and Snape comes in. 
with a goblet of smoking liquid. Right? Lupin tell, uh, Snape tells him, you should probably drink that soon and take some more tomorrow. Okay, and Lupin says, he's concocted a potion for me. It's very complex. It makes me feel better. Okay. Page 157. Harry says, Professor Snape's very interested in the dark arts. Really? Some people reckon he'd do anything to get the defense against the dark arts job. He's like, you really don't want to drink that. He's trying to kill you. Okay. So Harry goes off. Ron and Hermione come back. And they bring Harry some goodies. Um, and they go back upstairs to go into the common room. And we see that the fat lady is gone. And the reason she's gone is because she's been attacked by Sirius Black. And we'll pick up on Tuesday with the chapter Grim Defeat.